Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Gravitas, co-presented by Skoda Superb, best in next class. Co-powered by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is back in the headlines. It's a different matter that he may not like any of them. What do these headlines say? Turkey has not been this isolated in 50 years. Erdogan's political challengers are getting tougher. Honeymoon over for Erdogan's Turkey in Africa. Turkey's economic problem is Erdogan. Improvement won't come until he leaves. These are just some of the headlines. But you get the idea. Erdogan's Ottoman dreams seem to be fading. He's losing friends both at home and abroad and he has only himself to blame for this. On Gravitas tonight we'll discuss what ails Turkey and how it fits a pattern. When a leader lets his personal ambition drive his public policy and shape his foreign policy, it can only spell bad news for his country. History has shown this over and over again. Turkey may end up on the same list. Also on the show tonight, a few days back, India was debating if there is such a thing as too much democracy. Well, ask Israel. It's bracing for its fourth election in two years. Is there such a thing as too much debt? Ask Pakistan. It's buried under it. And now China wants guarantees on more loans. How's the virus from China doing? Mutating into fast-spreading versions. The UK has been struck by two, causing panic, lockdowns and travel chaos. And there's always a business model for every situation. A company is now selling bottled air for the homesick. Those who cannot make it home for Christmas. Talk about being creative. We'll begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. Three policemen were shot dead in central France after they responded to a domestic violence incident in the early hours of Wednesday. French President Emmanuel Macron paid tribute to the three policemen, hailing them as heroes. According to the country's interior minister, the man suspected of killing the police officers has been found dead. As the Nepal political crisis deepens, the Chinese ambassador Hu Yangqi met Nepal's president Bidya Devi Bandari on the day Prime Minister KP Sharma Oli was expelled from the party. Former Nepal Prime Minister Prachanda, after being elected as the parliamentary party leader of Nepali Communist Party, has said that he will take all the like-minded parties together and form the government with their support. After the Prime Minister called for dissolution of the parliament, the rift has widened with the Nepal Communist Party supposed to be divided into two factions led by Oli and the country's former Prime Ministers Pushpa Kamal Dahal and Madhav Kumar Nepal. Bhutan has imposed a seven-day lockdown to contain the spread of the coronavirus. All schools and offices will remain closed while only designated shops will be allowed to operate. Restrictions have been imposed on inter-district travel. Those traveling during the lockdown will have to get a special permit from the government. Bhutan has nearly 500 COVID cases. The country is yet to report a fatality from the disease. UK traffic wallowed back into France after the countries reached an agreement over their shared border, which was closed during a 48-hour period, amid concerns over a new coronavirus variant contributing to a surge of cases in Britain. US President Donald Trump has issued a series of pre-Christmas pardons, granting clemency to two people convicted in the special counsel's Russia inquiry and to four Blackwater guards convicted for war crimes. The pardons are a very positive thing for a president. Analysts say the wave of pardons are not likely to be the last before Trump leaves office on January 20th. 
UNICEF has warned about dire conditions for 250,000 children displaced by insurgency in Mozambique as it launches an appeal for $254 million in funding. Turkish customs officials detained a 72-year-old German national of Croatian origin using Maradona portraits to smuggle 2.5 kilos of cocaine. The drug trafficker arrived at the airport from Colombia. A massive Antarctic iceberg shifted direction and broke due to strong currents in the Southern Ocean. It is now headed towards the South Georgia Sandwich Islands. The iceberg measuring 4,200 square kilometers is riding a fast track current towards the island. Lionel Messi has broken Pelé's record of most goals for a single club after scoring in Barcelona's 3-0 win over Real Valladolid. The Argentine notched up his 644th goal in the second half when Barcelona were already leading by two goals. Pele had scored 643 goals for Brazilian club Santos during an 18-year long stint that ended in 1975. Defending champions Los Angeles Lakers have been beaten by city rivals LA Clippers on the opening night of the new NBA season. Seemingly still in party mode from the ring ceremony that preceded the game, LeBron James's Lakers fell behind by 22 points in the opening quarter itself. They did manage to cut the deficit to just one point, but Paul George scored 26 points in the second half to keep the Clippers ahead and eventually seal a 116-109 victory. He wanted a neo-Ottoman empire, but Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan is now fighting for survival. His dreams to lead the Muslim world could end prematurely. Erdogan is paying the price for his adventurism, for picking unnecessary fights with world leaders and for waging costly wars. His allies are deserting him, his party is breaking up, his voters are losing faith in him and his critics are ending up in jail in the thousands. Yesterday we told you how Turkey's president put more than 900 children on trial for insulting or mocking him. He even jailed some of them, children as young as 12 years. This exposes the desperation of a leader. Tonight on Gravitas, we'll tell you where this desperation stems from. Turkish President Erdogan's many missteps are threatening his regime. Our story begins with a resignation, one that missed the eye of many around the world. It happened a few weeks back. Bulent Arinç is a founding member of Turkey's ruling party, Erdogan's Justice and Development Party. He is a former deputy prime minister. He served on the presidential high advisory board, which is basically a board of top advisors to the Turkish president. In short, this man, Bulent Arinç, was part of Erdogan's inner circle. Then suddenly he decided to leave. According to reports, Arinch and Erdogan had a dispute over reforms. Arinch also wanted the release of two high profile prisoners, but Erdogan was in no mood to comply. In fact, he picked a fight. He publicly accused his deputy of quote unquote standing with terrorists. Now we're not sure on what basis these charges were made, but coming from Erdogan, they are a bit rich, standing with terrorists. And so it happened that Arinch resigned. It is significant because it's not the first such high-profile resignation. President Erdogan's top aides have been leaving him. His party is splintering and driving these departures is dissent, disagreement with the president. The defections at the lower level began last year. By September 2019, Erdogan had lost 8,40,000 members. Yes, you heard that figure right. 8,40,000 members left President Erdogan's party by September 2019. What triggered this mass exodus? A series of high-profile exits. Two key members of the president's party left him. Ali Babajan, the former Minister of Economy, and Ahmed Davutuolu, a former Prime Minister. Someone who is considered to be a close ally of Erdogan. These exits led to more departures and whenever a top leader leaves a party, he takes his supporters with him. It happens everywhere in the world. The mass departure started showing in official data of the president's party. In August 2018, the Justice and Development Party had lost almost 11 
they had almost 11 million members. In one year, those numbers dropped to less than 10 million. Even Erdogan could not ignore these defections, so he tried to spin the story in a speech. Guess what he said? He claimed that 95% of the members who'd left his party have actually died. Well, it's hard to say how many people bought the argument. The two top leaders who left launched their own political outfits. They split the voter base of the president's party. Erdogan's popularity has taken a hit, and we have the numbers to show it. Opinion polls in the last two months go against the Turkish president. In October, 78% of the people of Turkey believed that the economic situation of the country is getting worse. 58% of the respondents who supported Erdogan's party in elections felt that the economy is doing badly. The president's ratings have plummeted. In the same month, support for his party has fallen to 28.5%. In November, 46.6% of the citizens of Turkey did not approve of Erdogan's performance on the job. So you have high-profile exits, defections that run into lakhs, and a decline in popularity. This situation only makes Erdogan's position as president more fragile. Do remember he does not have a majority in parliament. He runs a coalition government with former party leaders forming their own outfits. The opposition against the president is mounting. He has already lost allies abroad, and now he has pushed his friends towards the opposition, and they plan to corner him on one issue more than anything else, and that is Turkey's economy. Erdogan waged his fights abroad, betting on the Turkish economy. He had hoped that the Turkish economy will be able to foot the bills of his battles. Well, it cannot. The economy of Turkey was considered a regional success story. But now the problems are piling up. Turkey's central bank used borrowed money to save the lira, the currency. Now it has a deficit that could run into billions of dollars. Our next report tells you more about the holes in Turkey's balance sheets. The Turkish economy is unraveling. The month of November brought with it more bad news. Turkey's inflation rate soared to a little more than 14%. It's a 15-month high and it hurts the people of Turkey directly. Consumer prices have risen by 2.3%. It's limiting what people can afford to buy. Day-to-day -day expenses have gone up. Food, beverages and transport have become costlier. But this may be just the beginning of Turkey's problems. Its currency, the lira, has tanked. Since the beginning of this year, the lira has lost nearly 30% of its value against the dollar and more than 30% against the euro. What is the government doing to fix this? Well, hiding the extent of the rot. According to reports, Turkey is spending far beyond its means. The pandemic has widened the cracks in the Turkish economy. It has exposed a $25 billion hole that the Erdogan government was trying to hide. In March, Turkey's foreign currency reserves were propped up by short-term borrowing. As the lira began to slide, Turkey's central bank spent billions of dollars to stop the bleeding. Dollars that were borrowed from domestic banks. By August, Turkey owed more foreign currency to banks than what it had in its coffers. The central bank owed $54 billion to Turkey's banks. According to an estimate, the Turkish central bank ended up spending around $65 billion by August. More than what it had borrowed. The central bank ended up $25 billion short. By the end of September, the situation worsened. Turkey's foreign reserves are said to be in deep negative territory. One estimate puts the deficit at $50 billion. <laughs> Turkey only has Erdogan and his family to blame for this crisis. The international press has pointed fingers at Berat Alberak, the president's son-in-law, who suddenly resigned this year from the post of Turkey's finance minister. Al-Berak is said to have been the brain behind the plan to rescue the lira by pumping more money. A plan that cost Turkey $140 billion in two years. Difficult choices lie ahead for Erdogan. 
A steep decline in the lira now could potentially bankrupt Turkish banks. The other option is a steep interest rate hike. This will stabilize the lira, but throw the Turkish economy into a deeper recession. The Turkish president finds himself stuck between a rock and a hard place. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Let me ask you a question. What was Hitler's dream? To rule the world. We all know how that ended. Mussolini wanted to be the leader of a new Roman Empire, one that stretched from Africa to Asia, from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. What happened then? The dictator was voted out of power by his own Grand Council. More recently, Saddam Hussein wanted to be the next Nebuchad Nazar the longest ruling and the most powerful leader of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Saddam's life and regime ended tragically, to say the least. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has not learned from history. He wanted to be the caliph, the ruler of the Muslim world. His stint, too, seems to be staring at an end. You see, when a leader's personal ambitions shape a country's public policy, let alone dictate his foreign policy, the country is bound to go downhill. Turkey may be on that path. As for its president, Erdogan is showing all signs of an imminent fall. He is losing friends at home, he is losing friends abroad, he is losing voters, and his country's coffers are losing money. These are typical signs. This is how authoritarian leaders fall. A leader is supposed to cater to his country. Erdogan fed his personal dreams. He wanted to be the caliph, as we've been saying, so he took on Saudi Arabia. He wanted the loyalty of the Muslim world, so he picked fights with Europe. He needed Pakistan's support, so he raised Kashmir at the United Nations and burnt bridges with India. He needed votes at home, so he turned the Museum of Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Erdogan's theatrics were rightly rewarded. He lost votes at home and earned sanctions abroad. His party lost its hold on Ankara and Istanbul. Two big allies left Erdogan, both citing economic decline. Do you know, old allies walking out is a curtain call for leaders. It signals that their time in office is over. Recent history is proof. Malaysia, Georgia, Ukraine, Kenya, Nigeria, across the world, autocrats have fallen after their top allies left them. Is Erdogan heading towards the same fate? An opinion poll found that 18% of Turkey's voters would vote a former confidant of the president. The poll was conducted in July 2020. A lot of water has passed since then. Erdogan's record has worsened. Turkey's isolation is evident, as is its president's downfall. As we said, this too fits a pattern. Leaders who are driven by their personal ambition lead their countries to disaster. U.S. President Donald Trump, for instance, let his personal whims dictate his policy. America lost friends and allies, and Trump lost the election. Chinese President Xi Jinping is another example. Guided by his personal desire to rule the world, he has driven his country into a crisis. One too many, in fact. Personal dreams cannot drive a country. Trump couldn't make America great again. Chinese hawks and scholars are unhappy with Xi Jinping. If a leader shapes his policies on personal ambitions, he is bound to fall. The rule of exception may not apply to Recep Tayyip Erdogan. But we'd like to dwell on China and the president of China. He's trying to make a virtue out of a necessity. He's trying to turn a food crisis into a war on food wastage. Now, if you've been watching our reports, you would be aware that China is running out of food supplies. Pork, corn, wheat, rice, barley, almost every necessary food item is in short supply. The prices are soaring by the day. The imports have jumped by a huge margin. Things have turned so bad that China has turned to India for rice imports, notwithstanding the PLA's mischief in Ladakh. But even the imports from India have not been able to curb the food shortage. So Xi Jinping has come up with another bright idea. He's set to criminalize food wastage. Overeating will be a crime in China. His party has proposed to draft legislation for this. And under this proposal, restaurants that promote exorbitant meals will be fined. Chinese citizens will face penalties over leftovers. 
and anybody, any platform, any TV channel, any celebrity, anyone who endorses overeating will be punished under law. Here's an objective analysis of the food crisis and how it is being concealed by being turned into a war against overeating. Six percent of China's total food production is wasted annually. That is more than 35 million tons of food gone to waste. Out of this, 18 million tons is wasted at the last stage of the supply chain, food consumption. Chinese President Xi Jinping says he wants to reduce this colossal waste of food. In 2013, he launched a campaign, Operation Empty Plate. This campaign targeted big feasts held by Chinese officials. In August 2020, this campaign was extended to the public. Digital celebrities were banned from making videos where they stuffed their faces with junk. And Chinese citizens were asked to eat frugally. But the campaign did very little to end food wastage. So the Chinese president has decided to take his war on waste one step further. Operation Empty Plate is set to be enshrined into law. A draft legislation has been submitted to China's highest legal committee. The proposed rules are these. Food outlets will face penalties if they mislead consumers to order excessive meals. Offenders may face fines up to 10,000 yuan or $1,500 if they fail to comply repeatedly. Restaurants will be allowed to charge customers for excessive amounts of leftovers. Arguably the most famous feline on the planet. She inspired a meme fest on social media. Then there's Oscar, the furry grim reaper. He lives at a nursing center in the US. Oscar would curl up next to patients hours before their death fits the demonic bill, but there's probably a scientific explanation. Mythology has not been kind to cats either. They are often portrayed as the devil's courier and the gatekeeper of hell. But grumpy isn't always a bad thing. After all, nobody is perfect. Bureau Report, we on World is One. A new type of meat has gone on sale in Singapore. It looks and apparently tastes just like the real stuff. But there is no slaughtering involved. The meat was grown in a lab. So is this the future of modern cuisine or does it sound too good to be true? Our next report explores. It's the age-old rule of nature. For you to eat a chicken, a chicken must die. But that could possibly be changing. Take a look at this tender piece of chicken nugget. Certainly looks appetizing. What if we told you that it's not actually chicken, that no animal was slaughtered for it? This piece of meat is actually grown in a lab. We take a sample from a living chicken. Uh, this current cell line has uh, been taken from a chicken named Ian who lives in California. Uh, and he's still living to this day. We didn't have to kill any animals to produce this chicken. So we took a, just a, a very simple sample from one of his feathers. Earlier this month, Singapore approved lab-grown meat. The first country in the world to do so. And today was the big debut. The setting was 1880. A restaurant in Singapore's Robertson Quay. The first diners were a group of kids all of them young climate warriors. The lab-grown chicken looks like the real stuff, but how does it taste? The owner of 1880 says you won't be able to tell the difference. With this product, my expectation was actually, you know, 50%. And when I tasted it on Saturday, uh, it by far exceeded my expectation. And I would, I would wager that in a blind taste testing, I wouldn't know the difference. Lab-grown meat was pioneered by Eat Just, a startup based in the United States. The idea was to make meat consumption more sustainable. Plus, you can finally rid yourself of that guilty conscience. So, is this the jackpot? 
the future of non-vegetarianism? Not yet. For starters, it's a lot more expensive. One chicken nugget is selling for $50, far from affordable. The other issue is time. Growing large chunks of meat cell by cell is a tedious process. And don't forget, they are competing with broilers that reach market size in a month and a half. Finally, there is the issue of safety. Singapore is the only country where lab-grown meat is sold. The question is, why? If it's a game-changer, why haven't more countries approved it? A shift from natural meat to lab-grown meat would be seismic. Millions of consumers would have to be convinced. Thousands of poultry farmers will need new jobs. It is not going to happen overnight, but there is no denying that it's desirable. Lab-grown meat offers sustainability and variety. You could choose which part of the animal to grow and what kind of texture to mimic. A plate of bespoke meat could become a reality. But we're still years away from that level of perfection. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. Where there's a will, there's a way. I know you've heard this. Now consider this one. Where there's fear, there's opportunity. Not a very ethical line, but truth nonetheless. The fear of gaining weight, for instance, was an opportunity for the green tea market. Today it is worth $12.8 billion. The fear of a sloppy morning was a boost for the global coffee market. Today it's worth $102.15 billion. The fear of the Wuhan virus too has given rise to a market. A market with innumerable products. You won't believe what's on sale. Ranging from food to electronics, clothing to furnishing, all the products in this market are sold with one pitch. Antivirus, pro-immunity, I'm sure you've seen them online and on shelves offline. We did a quick search and we found immunity booster juice, antiviral clothes, bed sheets, cleaning products, ice creams, laddus, milkshakes, fabrics, wall paints, you name it and they have it. Everything is being sold on the promise of immunity. Wellness gurus are selling advice, ads are selling promises, and the market is selling products. So many of them that you can literally set up a house with products that have come up since the pandemic struck. And guess what? Even air can be arranged, believe it or not. The pandemic has not just triggered the fear of the virus or the obsession with immunity, it has also triggered homesickness. There are travel bans. A lot of people are st stuck far away from their home countries. So a British company has come up with a rather unique product. Bottled air for the homesick. For homesick Britons to start with. There's a range of fresh air from different locations in the UK. There's Scottish air, English air, Welsh air, Irish air. The company is promising the smell of home to homesick expats. There are also limited edition bottles with air taken from the London underground. For food lovers, there is limited edition air from a fish and chips shop in Norfolk. Can a country's smell be captured in a bottle? Can a piece of clothing boost your immunity against the Wuhan virus. There is no evidence for any of this. Are these companies fleecing customers? A consumer group in Australia thinks so. It has sued a company for branding its apparel as quote unquote, a cure for the spread of COVID-19. The brand is called Lorna Jane. It launched its antiviral activewear, activewear in July. It has now been slapped with a fine of nearly 30,000 US dollars. Will this set a precedent? Will it be a deterrent? Or will companies continue to push the antiviral tagline? What about consumers? Will they buy such a sales pitch in their desperation to defeat the virus? Well, here's the thing. Crises also trigger irrational responses. So do not judge people who fall for the antiviral pitch. Crises also, as we said, come with opportunities. Try to tap those. Be creative. If people can sell packaged air and make money off it, there is hope, an immense possibility. On that note, it's a wrap. We're leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.
Ale jsem povinná, tak tam hore.